And the final number tonight is 32. Yeah. 32. Yeah. Now, Granny, don't believe in your mm. vital organs on the mm. stairs. Mm. She's a little ropey neck. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did me numbers oh. come up or what? Huh? Huh? Oh, what? Oh, the lottery. Um, I never thought of it. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, what do you want to uh, go gambling for, anyway? It's a mugs game. Huh? Uh, and if you won it, you'd only end up like Lorcan Piles, the winner of Ireland's biggest ever jackpot. Twelve million pounds. Twelve million doesn't sound too bad to me. Oh, doesn't it? Well, you better listen to this, then. Lorcan was a farmer's son from a little town called Bumford, near Castle Colon. Oh, yeah. Himself and his best mate, Mossy Merulachon, moved up to Dublin ten years ago and spent day and night working in the slaughterhouse in Ring's End. Like yourself, Lorcan did his regular numbers every week. It was a Saturday night and Lorcan's luck was in. He won the jackpot. He celebrated well into the next morning with Mossy. <laughs> Money will never come between us. You'll always be my best mate, Mossy, said Lorcan with a drunken tear in his eye. Ah, fair say to him. <laughs> but I bet he fecked off on his friend. Ah, no, he didn't. No. He, he was an no. honest sort and knew the value of friendship. In fact, the night before the lottery check was due, Lorcan told Mossy that he'd like to treat his best friend to whatever he wanted. No expense spared. But you've bought yourself nothing yet, said young Mossy. But since you're asking, <laughs> there is something I've always dreamt of. Oh, uh, 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 a car. No, no, a uh, helicopter. No. Oh, a Massey Ferguson 5000. No. Oh. It was a, a more unusual request. Oh. I saw an ad in one of them magazines. Her name's Carmen Sutra, and she can do 25 positions in a one night stand. Oh, the dirty <laughs> oh, 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 25 positions. Yeah. Let's see now. There's a. There's a. There's. There's. There's one. Uh, uh, two. And then. Uh, anyway, Lorcan uh, agreed to pay the mistress a pleasure to make a house call the very next night. At seven o'clock the next evening, there was a knock on the door. Huh? It was Carmel Sutra herself. Oh, she was early because Mossy wasn't home yet. Lorcan opened the door and was stunned by her beauty. Oh. You're early. M M Massey's not here yet. He stuttered. Mm, it gives me just enough time to pleasure you. Oh. She replied. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's a number he couldn't refuse. You're right. He couldn't. She lured him to the bedroom. Ah, I hope he remembered to empty the chamber pot. And she pleasured him in 25 ways. 25 ways? Are you sure about this 25? And then to finish him off, she slit his gizzard. She killed him! Eh? Oh, but while they were... Eh? Jesus. Now I'm confused, Podge. Why on earth did she kill poor Larkin? Well, let me finish the tale. The next morning, the lottery man arrived at the door and rang the doorbell. I have a check for 12 million pounds for Lorcan Piles! That'd be me! Huh? Said Mossy, as he swiped the check and handed over the winning ticket. Some friend he was. The thieving, murdering, double-crossing Arsagon! And the whore was the lure. The lure indeed! Uh, but uh, an assassin, to be more exact. You really find out who your friends are when you're in the money. Right, well, that's it. No more lottery for me. Oh, I... Uh, oh, I... I'll, 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 sleep. I'll take that, uh, that ticket there now and, and put it in the bin. <laughs> Do a minute. And the final numbers are 3, 5, 13, 15, 29 and 32. Yeah, boy, yeah. Four numbers. <laughs> oh, damn it. Uh, hello, is that Ballydrum Escort Agency? Can I speak to Miss Fantasia? Oh. Bring the clamps. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, I 
I tell you what? Our boat's finally come in. What do you mean? A couple of women have moved in next door. Oh, Jesus, tell me more. Well, I'll tell you this much. Ah! I know they're foreign. Right. H- have you seen them? No, but Squints McCabe from the pumps says they're uh, lesbians. Oh, uh, from Lesbania. It's one of them uh, eastern commie block countries. Right, yeah, but who cares where they're from? Why don't we just go round there and knock on the door with our tools in our hands? What? In case the place needs fixing up. Oh! I thought it'd be a good right. way to get in. Oh, very good, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? I'd love to go off somewhere foreign. To one of them, eh, uh, uninhibited holiday resorts. Oh, really? Where young 18 to 30 year olds Wait. would flaunt their naked hot oil right. flesh and they're flaunting their naked nipples. Will you, have you right? Shut up, will you? Right. I drink from a hooer's slipper before I'd embark on a holiday to hell. I was thinking more of the uh, Costa del Sol. It doesn't matter where you go, you'll probably never make it home. Huh? Just like Michael Scratcher. Mickey Scratcher? It was a month before his ordination. Oh, I never knew he was a holy Joe. Oh, yeah. And his mother was so proud of her son going to be a priest. Because thank God one of her sons was doing something decent with his life. That's right. Yeah, I heard about the brother, Willie Scratcher. Yeah. Uh, he was a no good gobsheen. Never in and out of trouble, that fella. Anyway, Mickey decided to go on his first ever foreign holiday, and the last before he became a priest. He wanted to go on a pilgrimage to South America and visit the tomb of Saint Recta of the Seven Ninjas. That's a fierce faraway place to be going. <laughs> It said the fella in Sputum's travel. The only thing I've heard about there is, <laughs> whatever you do, don't use the taxis. Mickey packed his bags and left on his little adventure the next day. Only his mother made it to the airport to see him off. His brother Willie was nowhere to be found. When he arrived, there wasn't a bus in sight. Ah, uh, I suppose he used the old taxis. Yep, you oh. see, it was a fierce backwards place. Bit like uh, Ross Common. Yeah. A very pleasant local man walked up to him, you see. My name is Pinos. I am your hotel special taxi driver. I will take you to your place of stay. Then Mickey threw his case in the back seat and headed off. The taxi weaved through the streets and came to a sudden halt outside what seemed to be the local police station. Three armed police ran up to the taxi and reefed Mickey out of the back. The taxi sped off and Mickey was dragged inside. He must have shat himself. They went through his belongings as Mickey tried to communicate with them. None of them spoke a word of English. Until one of them pulled a clear plastic bag out of Mickey's suitcase and said the word... Opium. (gasps) The feckers had planted opium on him. He was stripped naked, beaten up and cavity searched. Oh, jeez. And thrown into a rat-infested, feces-strewn cell. Three days later, he was dragged out of the cell and brought to a makeshift courtroom. A man came over to him and put his hand in his shoulder. My name is Pinos. I am your lawyer. You are in muchos trouble, senor. Let me explain the way things work in these parts. Oh no, you are accused of drug trafficking, and this is punishable by death. Thus, your embassy will not assist you in drug-related cases. On trace, you must plead guilty. But, but I... I'm innocent, cried Mickey. If you plead not guilty, you will die without trial. Plead guilty, and the judge will show you leniency. What happened? He pleaded guilty and was hanged by the neck next morning. What? Jesus, that's harsh. I thought the judge was going to be lenient. Uh, He was. uh, You see, Mickey died a a quick death rather than a long, drawn-out, torturous nightmare. His body was sent home to his grieving mother. It was a big funeral, and even his brother Willie shocked everyone by turning up. The locals had thought he had turned in his ways as he stood by the graveside right into the night. It's a bit late for regrets. The next morning, the mother went up to pay her respects to her son and was confronted by something a mother should never have to see. What? Her son's grave desecrated and the rotting corpse torn apart. The weird thing was, his insides were all missing. What did the mad brother do with Mickey's insides? Nothing. The insides never made it back from South America, as they had been substituted for 30 kilos of pure opium. Willie had set the whole thing up and used his brother as a corpse courier. With a street value of 20 million, 
a bad bastard was never seen again. Jesus, that's shocking. Hey, I've just thought of something, though. But Those lesbians have come an awful long way from Lesbania. They must be starving. Yeah, if it's one of them Eastern Bloc countries, I'm sure it's been ages since they've had a bit of meat inside them. Yeah. What could we do for them? Oh, how about a tongue sandwich? That's a great idea. Is there any meat in the fridge? Oh, I'm sure there we'll is. We'll sort something out there. That'll do them grand. I'm sure they'd be very impressed. Jesus, that's an awful big hole. What's that cat up to? Good boy. Pops, what are you at? Huh? I'll leave him alone. He's only at me nuts. He what? <laughs> He's licking the salt off them. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Get out of there, you devil. <laughs> oh, I never thought, eh? Matt. Would you care for a pistachio? <sighs> oh, Jesus. Huh? You have to get that blue fixed or move house or something. This is nothing compared to the misery of moving house. Let me tell you the true tale of the McCardles and the curse of Muff Cottage. I'm all ears, Podge. <laughs> well, there was Ardle McCardle, his wife Gimpna, and their new baby son, Urinal. Ah, that's a lovely name. They were trying to find a house in Dublin, right. as Ardle had just been promoted to head office. Dublin? Where all the Dublin punces live? And they wanted a house in either Ballsbridge or still Oregon. Oh, well, I always fancied the place in Ring's End myself. <laughs> anyway, they had no luck as the property market had gone mental. Duh. So they were forced to look a little further out. They spent weeks looking and it was soul destroying. Until one weekend they happened upon a village, Hoggers Hill. Ah. It was still only 40 minutes outside Dublin, and there was an ideal property up for sale. It needed a bit of work, but it was almost as if they were drawn to it. Muff Cottage? Yep. And they got it for a steal. They immediately moved in and began making the place their own. But it was the house that would make them its own. First thing the McCardles couldn't figure out was the heating. On a hot August afternoon, there would be a chill in the house. And in the winter, it would be too hot to stay in. Well, that's uh, strange, all right, but uh, hardly life threatening, Podge. That was only the beginning. How about the blood spurting from the taps, the plague of cockroaches, the mysterious shaking furniture, and the day they found little Urinal, who was not even walking, on top of the chimney pot. Jesus. The did they not get the place exercised? Oh, they tried to. They went to Father Flem, the local priest. Oh, I've been expecting you. There's nothing I nor God can do with that house. I'd leave now, if you can. I'd be out quicker than a hot snot. They got so spooked at the priest's words, they drove home and packed their bags. Urinal slept with his parents that night, as the house was colder than ever. They tried to ignore the sewage coming up through the floorboards, the incessant scraping and scratching coming from behind the walls. But at 2 a.m., everything went silent. Except for the baby monitor that Ardell had left plugged in, linked up to the nursery. And that was when the house spoke. The what? Out of the baby monitor came an unholy guttural voice. You can never leave me. Jesus. They ran out of the house, left everything where it stood. Did they ever go back? No. They experienced such a profound effect in the McCardles that they decided to make a fresh start in Australasia. The 14 months had passed, Mrs. McCardle had gotten over her nervous breakdown and Arnold had settled in nicely to a new job. Their new life was really shaping up, and they put the whole experience of Muff Cottage at the back of their minds. Ah, it's best, sir. They were enjoying a glass of wine one afternoon when little Arnold uttered his first words. Ah. You can never leave me! <laughs> 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 
and you're the same preceptor of the seven ninjas. Yeah, you see, they could leave the house, but the house would never leave them. Oh, tell you what, Podge, <laughs> them house demons are a scourge. Huh? Do you know what I'm just after noticing? Yeah. <laughs> There's a big bulge on the ceiling. It's just about to come down on your side. <laughs> oh, you think so, do you? Shite. <laughs> Thanks, house. No problem. Off. Hey, how do we look, huh? Have the pounds fallen off me, have they? Look. <laughs> no. You still look like a 200 pound gobsheen to me. You're getting awful obsessed with your weight. You'll end up like that fella, Willy Ring, from Tool End. Oh, Pudgy Ring! The big fat head, lardy boy! <laughs> he must have been at least 50 stone. Oh, he managed to lose the weight eventually. He spent years and hundreds of pounds on those newfangled contraptions like yours and, yeah. and all kinds of diets. But uh, he was having no luck at all. In fact, he practically given up altogether. Until back in 85, a new diet pill came out. Willie was as sceptical as ever until he heard what the pill could do. Oh, oh it was a medical wonder. All you took was one pill and you could continue to eat as much as you wanted, but the pounds would fall away. Oh, that's <laughs> with one pill. Did it work? Indeed it did. And thousands of people took the pill and continued to eat like pigs, but never gained another pound. Uh, Willie took it and indeed the pounds slipped away. He was delighted to be down to a nice svelte 12 stone. He was feeling great. That was until the night of the nightmare. His stomach hadn't been feeling great that day. His bowels didn't know if they were coming or going, so he decided to go to bed to sleep it off. <laughs> Had he a bit of a hot arse on him, did he? Yeah, but it wasn't his arse that concerned him. In his nightmare, his stomach started to rumble. He put his hand over it and could feel something moving inside. Then a sharp pain hit him like nothing he'd ever felt before. <laughs> as a snake-like head burst out of his belly and looked him in the eye. Jesus, for the love of St. Nicholas and the Seven Piles! Amateur was only a nightmare, or perhaps a premonition. He went to the doctors anyway with the stomach pains that were still bothering him. The doctor's face went ashen grey as he told him the symptoms. Oh, you wouldn't have taken one of them diet pills, would you? Immediately, the doctor sent him to a specialist in tropical diseases in Drogheda. Tropical di in Drogheda? Why would they send him there? Well, Willy Ring's nightmare had become a reality. You see, the miracle pill was not a pill at all, but an egg. An egg? Yep, an egg of a Polynesian tapeworm that had hatched and grown inside his stomach and eaten everything that Willy could throw at it. Trouble was... The diabolical pillmakers hadn't realised how big the tapeworm would grow. Well, how big did they grow? 30 feet long and 4 inches wide. Jeez, Pudgy had a feckin' python living in his dirt box! Uh, did they kill it? No, you, you can't kill it or it would release a deadly toxin. The only way is to starve them for a week and try to tempt them out of their host. What exactly now do you mean by, uh... Tempt them out. Well, there are only two exits in the human body that you could get a four-inch wide worm out of you. The way it got in, or the other end. <laughs> you mean the uh, 
tradesman's entrance. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, chocolate highway. Yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> The brown chimney. Yeah, 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 it, it shut up. Anyway, Willie made his decision to let the worm finish its journey, uh, so to speak. He had to squat over a saucer of milk and just wait. You see, a tapeworm can't resist the lactic acid in milk. Eventually it would pop its head out, and then the doctor would grab it by the neck and wrench it from your aching hole. Did Pudgy survive the ordeal? Yep, but it took three weeks of squat before they got the worm out. Poor old Willie died within the year. Couldn't face food again. Ended up wasted away to one stone, living in a shoebox wrapped in cotton wool. Jesus, what shocking. a way to go. Shocking, okay. Tell you what, no more of this diet and lark for me, so yeah, I'll take this yoke off. Oh, uh, uh, give it over uh, here. Uh, I- I'll drop the machine back for you in the morning. Huh? Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what are you doing, Podge? Uh, uh, it's a shame not to use up the batteries uh, after paying for them. Oh, uh, oh. right. Oh, yeah, more power. Oh. I heard you fiddling around the kitchen. What were you at? Huh? I was just sticking me freebie yogurts in the larder. You weren't shoplifting again, were no. you? No, 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 I was in old Stanky's mini market. They had uh, a newfangled biofungus yoghurt promotion. Right. And the one said the yoghurt had little creatures in it that crawl around your inside and clean up your pipes and sort of aid digestion and stuff. You're some arsegon getting involved with a cult. Huh? What's this about cults? I hope you were smart enough not to give them your name and address so they could contact you and further indoctrinate you with their ways. Of course I wasn't. But... What what have I had? You'll end up like Johnny Ballsack from Brown Logs Pass. He too filled in a survey for a brand new yoghurt. Called Gob. Gob? Eh. (sighs) Sounds creamy. (laughs) Wonder if they do fruits of the forest. A week later there was a knock at the door. There was a young couple there. Hello, Johnny. Have you had your gob today? Have I won something? Johnny asked as he invited them in. They told Johnny that they just wanted to talk to him about Gob, and that it was not just a yoghurt, but more a way of life. There was an old man sitting watching the telly. He didn't bat an eyelid. That's me old dad, said Johnny. He thinks I'm a feckin' agent. Hasn't talked to me in over 15 years. The couple took Johnny aside and told him that if he came with them, he would have a much more fulfilling life with Gob. Over the next couple of weeks, Johnny attended a number of gob meetings. He got on well with all the group, and for the first time in his life, he he felt like he fitted in. At the final gob conference, the head of Gob International, Yogi Gob himself, came to talk. He was a charismatic individual, and Johnny listened to every word Yogi said. It made complete sense, and all he wanted to do was go to America and join the Gob Brothers. (laughs) Sounds like a gob sheen to me. (laughs) So Johnny packed his bags and just before he headed out the door for his new life, he went to bid his father farewell. I know you think I'm an idiot, he said, but I'll prove you wrong and make something of myself, you miserable old fecker. For the first time in 15 years, Johnny's father turned his head away from the television set and looked him straight in the eyes. And said, You're a shite hawk, and you'll always be a shite hawk. Johnny left with a big puss on him, and more determined than ever to prove his old dad wrong, he set off for his new life with Gob in San Francisco. Upon his arrival at Gob headquarters, he had to sign over all his worldly belongings in exchange for a sheet to cover his privates. The next thing he got was uh, five wives. 
five fives! <laughs> <laughs> One for every night of the working week. Oh, and God only knows what he'd get up to at the weekends. <laughs> First thing he did was send his old man a postcard to let him know how he was getting on. I five wives. Who's the shade hawk now? <laughs> he boasted. Over the next couple of months, he began to enjoy the constant chanting and ritual body hair shavings. But it was the day he was summoned by his leader, Yogi Gob, that he really felt he had become somebody. Out of my thousands of followers, you, Johnny Balzac, are the chosen one. Johnny's face lit up. <gasps> he had been waiting all his life for a bit of recognition. We will have a party in your honor tonight, and there you shall become one with Gob. Johnny ran back to his quarters with excitement and wrote another postcard to his dad. I'm the chosen one. They're having a party for me. So... Who's the shite hawk now? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so he sent the card and off he went to his party. There were thousands at the gathering and Johnny had a big proud head on him. After a bit of chanting, Yogi stood up and asked Johnny if he was ready to become one with God. I surely am. This is the proudest moment of my life. With that, the guards grabbed Johnny and tied him to a rack. But I, I, I thought he was the chosen one. Now he was, but the only way to meet Gob is to go to the other side. You see, Johnny was to be this new cult's very own the sacrificial lamb. So what did they do to him? Everything. Even the old... H-P-U-A. Yep. Hot poker up the arse. But first they skinned him. And the whole time he was still alive, they cut his insides out and burnt them in front of him. He endured three hours of excruciating agony at the hands of his so-called friends. As he was breathing his last breath. <sighs> as they were pulling out his teeth with pliers, poor Johnny Balsack remembered his old father back in Brown Logs Pass and thought to himself, Who's the shite hawk now? <laughs> I'll tell you something. Uh, Them cults are a bugger on your back. Yeah, you're right. Ooh. What? What? What's that? What's that? Oh, uh, no! no! Sounds like Granny's found me yogurt stash. Now look what you've done, you big gobsheen. What? Well, it's that biofungus digestive yogurt. What? And Granny's been backed up for five months after eating that dry cat food. It'll be like flushing out the channel tunnel. Oh, oh. Jesus. Oh. oh, you get the bin liners. Uh, I'll get the shovel. Oh, the smell. Oh, here. I better call the skip. This is great. Sadie from the abattoir says she loves the man with the tattoo. <laughs> this will really scramble her legs. <laughs> Make sure now that you get the spelling of the B magnet right, won't you? Uh, that's it, all done. Huh? Uh. That is. Ah, oh, great. <laughs> Do you know what? Uh. I think I might get something pierced next. Piercing, is it? Huh? You go ahead and pierce the arse off yourself. But I'll tell you this. Huh? You'll undoubtedly end up dead. What are you scuttering on about? Ah, uh, don't tell me you haven't heard the story of Dick Dalton from Bob Nubber. He got his first tattoo in the mid-80s, a harmless one. I love Iron Maiden. Shite! I wish I'd thought of that one. From that day forth, he was hooked. And after five years under the needle, he had 90% of his body surface covered in tattoos of all shapes and forms. Uh, come here. Did he have anyone's a buck naked wanton hussies with their pert nipples? And when he flexed his muscles, right. their massive cleavage. Right, right, calm <laughs> down, you feckless rogue. Anyway, Dick eventually took the only job he could get in town, with uh, the state of him and all, yeah. in gusset meat produce. Oh, the dog food place. Yeah. <laughs> I've dropped off a few dead mongrels there myself. <laughs> <laughs> you're a different with that shotgun of yours. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, they'd mince anything in that place. Hey, that's where all them mad CBS cows go and other disease-ridden livestock. Oh, yeah. Do you know what, though? I've heard they had the biggest mincing machine in Europe there. You're not wrong. 
and it was Dick Dalton's job to maintain the Minster to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And fair play to him, he struck at it and soon became head Minster. He even went and got himself hitched. <laughs> hitched? Oh, Jesus. She'd fall in love with a fellow with Jordans all over his flesh. Well, she was a like-minded soul, had a quite a few tattoos of her own, but oh. her main interest was in a body piercing. Oh. She had both ears done, her yeah. nose, her lips, the, the back of her neck, her, yeah. her belly button, her lips, and in between her fingers, her, her cheeks, and in fact, anything that would take a ring or a stud. <laughs> Tell you what, sounds like one of them sadomachinists to me. Yeah, anyway, that may be, but uh, the two freaks loved each other and it was plain to see. It was coming up to their third anniversary and he headed up to Dublin uh, to buy a, a, a big ring to surprise her. Ah, that's nice, yeah. So he got the ring put through his eye. Well, would that, would that not, like, uh, affect his sight? Uh, no. It didn't affect his sight at all, Raj. Oh. I see. <clears throat> through his meat. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he never got to show it to her. Uh, as he was called back to the factory on his way home, the minster was acting up. Uh, when he got there, the minster had shut down altogether. He inspected the razor-sharp blades. Perhaps uh, it was just a bit of a power Rush. surge or something, you know. Uh, so he decided to turn the mighty machine back on again. As the twin 1,000 horsepower motors roared into action again, there was one thing Dick had overlooked. It was the speeding turbo motors, creating a massive magnetic pull. Before Dick could get the safety cover down, he was pulled head first, uh, so to speak, into the thrashing blades. Jesus, magnetic pull, his little Mickey. If someone saw what had happened and hit the emergency stop button, the machine had minced Dick right up to his torso. He was still barely alive, but mangled too much to be saved. So they sent for his wife and a doctor. What happened then? Now yeah, the doctor said he was as good as dead. If they pulled him out, it would cause him untold pain and would kill him anyway. Don't pull me out, gasped Dick. It'll only feck up the motors. So he gave his wife a goodbye kiss and got her to start up the machine again. What a way to die. Yeah. Being shredded alive, metal tear in the flesh, bones crushed and uh. up in your eyes. Oh, from the sockets, teeth splintered, all to end up as a tin of bouncy chugs yeah. for a healthier dog. Yeah. Hey, I've just... <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? Yeah. What? Yeah. I've just thought some poor dog's going to end up gagging on that poor fella's ring. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah, come here. Right. Hand us over that mirror over there for look at me. Mm, tattoo. Hold on there. <laughs> there you go. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very funny, Podge. <laughs> but you're the gobsheen. Huh? You spelt it backwards. Um, that's because you're looking in the mirror, Raj. Oh, yeah, but... Yeah. Oh, shit. Hey, you still on for that piercing? I'll get the staple gun and some barbed wire from the garage. <laughs> Dick off. <laughs> Week. Oh. What did they do to you this year? Well, they grabbed me in the town square, nah. stripped me bollock naked, <sighs> tied me to a lamppost, spanked me stupid with a mackerel, shouting obscenities at me Jeez. while it's pouring hot wax oh. over me flesh before sticking a bicycle pump up me Jesus, ass. that's shocking. Uh, you're telling me. We agreed fifteen pound. I gave them a twenty and the bastards ran off with a change. Nah. Bastards. Don't worry, Raj. Oh. Most students get their come up in. Yeah, I'll never forget that story of the two girls in the bedsit in Rathmines up in Dublin in 1984. <laughs> Where all them Dublin punces live. Betty Bulbous and Mary O'Hare from Trim were in their first year in UCD. They rented a one bedroom bedsit 
and for the pair of them it was their first time away from home. <laughs> they were all excited, and they had their whole lives in front of them. Mary was particularly happy, as it gave her a chance to escape an intense relationship with a local lad called Gobda O'Hurlihy. He was incredibly possessive and jealous. I'm warning you, Mary O'Hurley. Leave me, and you'll regret it. But Mary packed her bags regardless, and after a couple of weeks, the girls were settling into their student lifestyles. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> were they smoking that uh, hashish? And staying up all hours listening to Christy Burke and Led Zeppelin tapes. <laughs> <laughs> they were having the crack, all right. Nope. But they kept an eye on their studies nonetheless. Yeah. The only thing that uh, left them a bit unsettled was the frequent break-ins on the road they lived on. Mary's father came down one weekend and fitted metal bars in the windows and left the family dog Rex with the girls for added security. <laughs> with that fella Rex now, would he have as many diseases as our Pox? Ah, no, not at all. <laughs> our Pox, you're the bestest wicked fella Yay. with the most diseases in the wholest world. Yay. Go on, go on, go on, Anyway, <laughs> that seemed to reassure what? the girls, and the dog slept by the girls' bedside every night. Oh, by the bed. Jesus. <laughs> Imagine being that dog. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Being privy to two young ladies, stripping off every night. No, no, uh, I mean, being able to lick your own butt. You dirty what? beggar. A couple of weeks had passed and the girls had been sleeping well. They got into a routine of every night locking up and with their very own guard dog felt safe and secure. One Friday night the girls had planned to go out clubbing with their student pals. But uh, Mary wasn't feeling well and decided to have an early night instead. Uh, Betty said, I won't even turn on the lights when I get back. Ah, that's good word. And with that, Betty left and Mary locked the door behind her. Come here. Did they go to uh, Leeson Street? Yeah. Uh, to one of their flesh farm discos where just a glance could mean a bedroom encounter. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and they danced till four o'clock in the morning. It was pitch dark when Betty got back home, but she remembered not to turn on the lights, as it would disturb Mary. She felt her way across the bedroom, oh, almost okay. tripping over the dog. Oh, a good boy, she said, as he gave her a reassuring lick on the cheek. It was noon when Betty woke up to the sound of drip, drip. Huh? Her head was throbbing with a hangover, but that was nothing compared to the outrageous horror that confronted her as she threw back the curtains to wake up her best friend. <gasps> because Mary O'Hare would never be waking up again. <sighs> she had been stabbed a thousand times. Blood had seeped through the mattress and was dripping on the floor, and the dog was hanging by its tail from the ceiling light with its throat cut out. But that dog, uh, it, it licked your one's face when she got into bed. Uh, Betty soon realised that it wasn't the dog at all. There was a message in blood scrawled on the mirror. It read, I told Mary she'd regret leaving me. Lucky you didn't turn on the lights, Betty, or you'd be dead too. Jesus. God, doll, Hurley. Mary's our jealous boyfriend. Yeah. And he gave Betty the lick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But how did he get in? Nobody knows. And he was never seen again. Jesus. Come here. You won Betty. She was very lucky to survive, wasn't she? Oh, was she? Huh? She ran in terror to the window to shout for help. She slipped on the congealed blood, uh. fell out and impaled herself on the bars that her friend's father had erected for their protection. <laughs> 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 She's neck ass, good to blood. That's the pain yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, just feckin' students, good night. Good oh, oh, night to you now. Yeah, yeah. Settle down there. Oh, oh, will you, God. will you say... Um, Rog. What? What's that sticking into me back? Oh, eh. Uh, that'll be the, uh, bicycle pump. Oh, oh God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Second 
tourists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> it's great crack. How many did you bag? Huh? Well, I slaughtered a Japanese head. I winged a couple of Yanks. Oh, it's great crack, Podge. Would you not come out yourself? There's a busload of Germans coming. We're planning an ambush at Devil's Horn Ridge. Nah. Uh, I had uh, another idea for them tourists. A ladies only. A B and B. But should we say uh, Granny's bed? There's there's only this one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you dirty bugger. <laughs> anyway, tourists are to be pitied after what happened to those two poor Yanks up in Ballybollock. Tell us more. Well, Ernie O'Hearney and Pierce McCracken from Schlongsville, Massachusetts, came all the way over to our little green island to trace their ancestors. And lo and behold, both the O'Hearneys and McCrackens were from the same little town in the Midlands called Ballybollock. So they drove from Dublin as far as they could, but they had to walk the treacherous dirt track through the bog to downtown Ballybollock. When they arrived, they were starving and soaked to the skin in the typical Irish weather. They found a pub, though. The Stick It In. <laughs> I bet the two of them strolled in with their fat American arses. <laughs> Indeed. It's up in the evening, CEO. I'd like a pint of your blackest stout, dude. And perhaps if your good lady could fix us some supper, that'd be mighty fine, Pierce said as they walked up to the bar. The barman started to pull the pints. <laughs> Great weather for ducks, said Ernie, trying to make conversation. That instant, the bar fell silent, and the barman turned to the two. It'd be best if you two fecked off out of here. <laughs> so he fecked them out, did he? <laughs> Aw, man, so much for that goddamn Irish hospitality, moaned Pierce as he pulled his hood up. Just then, a woman appeared. It was the landlady. She handed them both half a loaf of bread. Leave this place now, and I'd advise you not to eat this bread until you are the other side of this cursed bog. And for God's sake, stick to the path. She said before she disappeared back into the bar. You know what, Podge? <laughs> There's nothing I like more than a good cursed bog story. Isn't that right, Pox? <laughs> so they set off in the pitch black night to walk the miles back to their car. Despite the woman's warning, Pierce ate the bread. <gasps> sure, at that stage he was ravenous. Ernie being a, a bit more superstitious held on to his. After about two hours of bog walking, they both knew they were lost. Then out of the blackness, an unearthly squeal broke the silence. They could feel something approaching at speed. It's probably just a moose! <laughs> Pierce shouted at Ernie, who was running well ahead of his buddy. But Ernie knew no moose would make such a diabolical noise. Jesus. What on? The next thing Ernie heard was the screams of Pierce McCracken of the McCracken clan, obviously being slow. Following them. Then silence. Then the pounding again. He ran for dear life. His lung ached and his ankles fell swollen from the strain of running through the bog. The pounding and the squealing got closer. He threw off his jacket, his sweater, and the loaf of bread he had been carrying. The creature seemed to stop and tear at the discarded items. He ran for another mile or so when all of a sudden, bang! His chin smashed into the bumper of the car. He crawled into the driver's seat and it was never seen again. But what about his friend? Well, the next day the locals found yet another eyeless severed head in the bog. Jesus. Eh? I, I bet it was a werewolf, a, a big wild cat, you No, think? no, no. It was the devil duck. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I thought you said for a moment? I thought you said, <laughs> I thought you said the, uh, the devil duck. <laughs> to die by the beak of the devil duck of Bally Bollock is no laughing matter. The locals tell the story of the duck farmer who cruelly force-fed his caged ducks in order to artificially bloat their livers to cash in on the growing liver pate tree. <laughs> One duck just kept growing and growing. A heartless farmer could see the pound signs. It would be the biggest duck liver in the country. After a few months, the duck had grown six feet tall, and one morning when he came to feed it, the duck burst out of its undersized cage and got its first taste 
of human flesh. It pecked the farmer's eyes out and ripped his head clean off. Mother Duck's quack in admiration as the devil duck disappeared off into the boglands. So your man Pierce was well and truly ducked. <laughs> but uh, how did the other fella manage to escape like? Well, you see, it was the bread he had discarded that gave him a couple of yards lead on the beast, which is still at large, by the way. Right. Yeah. And ducks like bread right enough. Anyway, yeah. I'm off to slaughter new tourists. Are you coming or what? Rog, duck! Huh? What? Oh! <laughs> Every time the oldest joke in the book, oh, the duck shite. joke. The... <laughs> oh, gee, the... the way you landed in that gun there, I don't know if you'd get that out at all. I submit. Do what you will. Diddly 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 diddly. Ah, Jesus! Roger! Oh, for the love of Saint Beverly and the Hillbillies! Yeah, yeah um, well, I can That's explain. The best Halloween costume I've ever seen. Oh, Halloween! Yeah, right, right. Yes, this is me. Um, a Halloween costume, of course, tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Halloween. There's a whole night of Halloween horror planned ah, in the town. Nice. Ten thirty is the witch burn. Right. Exhumations at 11.30 and the leper disco is on at midnight down right. in Brown's Barn. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, Halloween always reminds me of that song by Fester in Ailen. Oh. I think it was through the third album, uh, Let Me In Your Back Door, Sadie, that one. Yeah. No, 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 I know the one you're on about. Huh? It was off the fourth album, the one they did in the uh, monastery. Fester and Aylan fiddling with, with the, the monks. monks. That's, That's the one, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, there was a great video to go with that one, I remember. Ah, yeah. right, the old Halloween oh, song yeah. is the one. <laughs> How is Fester and Aylan here? Welcome to our home. Will you just have a cup of tea with us, will you? Huh? We love Halloween, don't we, Aylan? Oh, yes, I almost forgot. Poor Aylan had a bit of an incident one Halloween. It's something we're all guilty of. Mishandling fireworks. Well, sure, the surgeon did the best they could. Went in too deep, though. They say it could ignite at any time. So we'll leave you with this song. Enjoy your Halloween, and remember, safety first. All Hallows' Eve's upon us, the witching hour once more. Bonfires are a-burning, kids knocking on the door. Throwing hedgehogs on the bonfire and dressing up is lots of fun. Never stick a foreign object up your bum No, you should never shove a banger up your arse on Halloween It's not clever, it's not funny, some think it's quite obscene You should never shove a banger up your arse on Halloween Cause you'll only blow your hole to smithereens Trick or treatin', pumpkin eatin', scary witch's cat Better give us money, missus, or we'll dump on your doormat. Bobbin' apples, shagging cows, there's games for old and young. But don't stick a fern object up your bum all together. No, you should never shove a banger up your arse in Halloween. It's not clever, it's not funny, some think it's quite obscene. You should never shove a banger up your arse in Halloween. Cause you'll only blow your hole to smithereens. Your arse on Halloween It's not clever, it's not funny Some think it's quite obscene You should never shove the banger Up your arse on Halloween Cause you'll only blow your hole To smithereens <laughs> Happy Halloween Thank you, yeah. Aiden, you're awful close to the fire there I don't... Great song, man. <laughs> that was brilliant. Hey, I finished my mask. Do you want to see it? I suppose so. 
<laughs> woo hoo hoo! Woo! Woo! Would it fool you, would it? <laughs> uh, Raj, <laughs> it's you. Uh, yeah, but would you know it was me underneath, <sighs> would you? <laughs> anyway, are you right? Uh, no. Um, huh? I'll catch up with you uh, later. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to drop in on Miss Dominina. The foreign one? Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of talk around town about her. They say she has her own slave. Uh, did, did they mention any names? Huh? No. R- right, right. Anyway, off you go. I'll catch up with you later. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> right, Pox. Let's go. The Mistress of Pain awaits. <laughs> no, you should never shove a banger up your arse and have a wean. It's not clever, it's not funny, so to think it's quite obscene. You should never shove a banger up your arse and have a wean. Cause you'll only blow your hole to smithereens. Oh, ho, 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 look at it. Don't mind if I do, bartender. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on, Pox, come on here, come on here. What kind of gobshine had hide a whiskey bottle under his pillow? <laughs> All right, Granny, eight o'clock for the Black Mass it is. Oh, God. She's like a noose around our neck, Pods. Oh. When is she ever going to go and die? Uh, the 28th of February. Huh? How do you know that? You must be psychic or something. No, that's when the deposit on the plot runs out. The plot? <laughs> <laughs> I see where you're coming from. <laughs> oh, wait, did you see a bottle anywhere? What, me? No. Uh, huh? Eh, uh, well, no. that reminds me, eh? Uh, I saw a programme on this morning on the television. Right. And it had your man, eh, uh, J.R. from Dallas. He was one of them spacemen fellas. Oh, right. And he has this genie yeah. that he found in a feckin' bottle. Huh? And I'm not joking you, Paul. Yeah. She was sex on legs. <laughs> and anything JR asked her to do, she'd say, Yes, master. Oh, Jesus. Imagine that, Pudge. Oh. Imagine all huh? you like. Huh? But it'd be a cold day in Tullamore before I'd take a wish from a genie. Huh? Have you not heard of Fergal Scuttle, the poor unfortunate from Dong, County Tip? He was a fisherman and, as you know, the Tipperary waters, well, they, they have a very poor yield. Poor deed, uh. But lo and behold, one day, he caught something in his net that was to change his life forever. Pollock! A feck up! It was an ancient bottle with hydra... He did... A strange writing on it. Did he give it a rope, did he? He did. And the bottle? Anyway, from out of the bottle appears a beautiful genie. She had the face of Mary Black, the legs of Linda Martin, and the bust line of Twink. Jesus, she really batter my sausage. (laughs) Fergal couldn't believe his eyes. And then she spoke. (laughs) Ah, you have woken me from a 5,000 year sleep. You are now my master. And as your slave, I must grant you three wishes. Fergal realised this was his big chance to escape his dreary, god-awful life. Right. I wish to be a millionaire. And with a blow of her nose, he instantly found himself in a big mansion, surrounded by luxury and money to do anything he wanted. Jesus, I'd have wished for that. Fergal was completely besotted with his genie, and couldn't keep his eyes off her. Does she have uh, one of them uh, jewels in her belly button? Oh. Calm down, you feckless <sighs> rogue. Over a candlelit dinner, the genie spoke of how she had been trapped in the bottle after her last master died. And after 5,000 <gasps> years, she was very grateful to Fergal for setting her free from her bottle prison. So, uh, you haven't had a boyfriend for 5,000 years then? Laughed Fergal as he gave her the eye. (laughs) 
Was he sniffing after her, was he? Yeah, he was. <laughs> but she was still having none of it. Ah, uh, come to bed with me, and I'll make up for 50 centuries. He repeatedly asked her over the next few days. The frustration was driving him crazy. Did he have a raging horn on him? Ah, oh. uh, why won't you sleep with me? Shouted Fergal. I do not wish to go to bed with you. She replied. Well, I wish to sleep with you. And with that, she had no choice but to grant his second wish. <laughs> I've wished for that too. So they were both as nature intended. In the silk sheet exuberance of the master bedroom, he snuggled up to the golden skinned beauty and got down to business. But that's when she started to giggle. Giggle? Why? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Forgive me, Master, but I have never seen one so small. She said. He couldn't believe what he just heard. Her laugh now piercing his ears. Oh, Jesus, that's harsh. If Fergal knew what his third wish must be. <laughs> I, I'd wish for that too. Right. I wish I was hung like a horse. He said defiantly. If that is your wish, Master, let it be so, said the genie. Fergal's third and final wish was granted. What, what did he say when his final wish was granted? He said... <coughs> as he swung from the rafters with a broken neck. <gasps> you see, this genie, being 5,000 years old and all, was not used to modern-day phraseology. And she had taken Fergal's last words literally. She laughed one last time at Fergal's little lad before she turned into a puff of pink smoke and flew down the neck of her bottle. For the love of Saint Ursula and the rabbit lepers, that's shocking. Huh? Anyway, yeah. Uh, if you do find that bottle, uh, would you give us a shout? <laughs> <laughs> would it be a would it be a whiskey bottle? You're not trying to hide a bit of tipple on your brother? <laughs> no, no, it's it's for uh, it's for Dr. Freenham. Why is it his birthday? Now, why would I want to give Dr. Freenham a sample of Granny's piss for his birthday? <laughs> the bu- huh? Jeez, would you look? <laughs> would you look? There it was all along. <laughs> Isn't that great? How was the date? Oh, it was great. Hey, look. Sadie gave me a love bite. Look. Uh, get away from me, you feckin' lump of Egypt. Uh, you know something? Sadie says we should sell this kip. You know what? We'd make a killing in the property market. Then maybe, uh... Me, me and her could get like a small oh. place together and, and well, yeah. well, you, you could find yourself... What the feck would a boner from the slaughterhouse know about the property market? She's a meat technician from the oh. abattoir, yeah. actually. <laughs> uh, oh, I uh, see the uh, Scottish couple, the Rashes place is up for sale. Yeah. I wonder where they're going. Uh, it doesn't matter. Jock Rash will always have a roof over his head. How do you mean? Well, he's in jail for life, Rog. He chopped up his wife in a drunken rage and stuck the bits in a bus. Jesus. Tell you what, she'll be missed. Everyone liked Fanny Rash. The night of the slaughter, a nosy neighbour rang the guards after hearing a scream. The cops arrived three days later, as, as they, they do. do. <laughs> Rash had plenty of time to clean up the gore. They found nothing. Oh, uh, Fanny's gone back to Dunfarton in Scotland to... Uh, a visitor mother. The guard seemed to buy his story, or so he thought, until Detective Spunk Murphy of the Limerick CID got involved. He called to the front door and started sniffing about. Oh, so the wife's in Scotland. <laughs> she must be caught up being away from your good self. My colleague in Dunfarton was hoping to bump into her. But he hasn't had much luck. 
Jock was sweating as the detective left. He knew he had to dig up the wife from under the floorboards and dump the body as far away as he could get it. Oh God. Was, was the detective on to him? Yeah, Jock didn't know, but he couldn't take the risk. So the next morning he left to the train station with a suitcase full of wife. <laughs> he would jump off at some no-name town and find a discreet place to bury the body. He got on the train and stowed his case in the luggage compartment. He sat down and began to read a newspaper and act as normal as possible. Ah, hello, Jock! Isn't it? He looked across the carriage and it was the last person he wanted to see. Mike Murphy from Winning Streak! No, you scutter and gobsheed. It was Detective Spunk Murphy. Well, isn't this a coincidence, Mr. Rash? Us on the same train and all. I have someone under surveillance. Jock broke out in a sweat. Yeah, he's in the next carriage. He's a drug dealer. Continued Murphy. For the first time in a week, Jock relaxed. It was just a coincidence that the detective was on the train. We've been after this lad for three years. <laughs> and at the next stop, we're finally going to nab him. Murphy told Jock. The drugs are in the luggage compartment, and our crack team will get on board and go through everything with a fine tooth comb. Jock went pale. <gasps> oh, I I've got to uh, go to the, uh, the jocks. He got up and headed straight for his suitcase. He had to get rid of it before the next stop. He took the name tag off his case <laughs> that he had stupidly forgotten to remove earlier and stuck it to a similar suitcase. Then threw the wife out the door. I suppose, what else could he do? At the next stop, a bunch of armed guards got on board. A few minutes later, a message came over the tannoy. We're sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. Could you please come, come and, and claim, claim the luggage? luggage? Jock was first there to claim the case that wasn't his. So, uh, this is your case? Asked Detective Murphy as he looked at the name tag. Uh, do you mind if I have a little look inside? Ah, go ahead, said Jock with a smile on his face. <laughs> A smile that instantly turned to horror as the jigsaw puzzle remains of a woman spilled out uh, onto the platform. Uh, hadn't he thrown the wife out the door? Yep. Or at least he thought he had. Oh, he was so uh, confused he broke down there and then. All right, I did it, I did it. I killed me wife. The police dragged him away as a smile crept across Detective Murphy's face. Because he got his man. <laughs> yep, but he'd also managed to get rid of Mrs. Murphy. Huh? Poor Jock had thrown his wife out the train door, but unbeknownst to him, the chopped up remains of the detective's wife were in an identical suitcase. Jeez. Murphy had the opportunity to oh. use Jock as a scapegoat and rid himself of his pretty but unsatisfying wife. That's some double cross. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, so when um, are you and Sadie going to move in together? Buy a fitted kitchen and have 2.4 dogs and an inside toilet? Maybe we will. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope uh, Granny will enjoy her new home. But, but what? But uh, but your but your Granny Granny be here with you? No, not at all. Uh, granny requires the care of two people. How's Sadie with the incontinence pants? Incont... Eh? Oh, right. Well, maybe not, eh? Uh, so... Oh. Right, I'll just mm. stay and uh, stay put. Fancy Right, I'll just, eh... Uh, incontinence. Have you got the rabies, huh? Great are you foaming at the mouth? Uh, there we are. Oh, how are you? What have you been up to, you dirty pervo? Huh? What are you talking about? It's me escapology night classes over in the pubic's town library. I'm the great Rajini. You mean the great scuttering gobshini? 
That's one big waste of time, and I'll tell you why. Because the mould Geraghty was Ireland's premier safecracker and an accomplished jailbreaker. His life was just one big game, robbing banks, getting caught, going to jail and breaking out. The authorities were fed up with his escapades and eventually threw him in the hole. The hole? On Hole Island? Sure no one's ever gotten out of there. Well, Gus the Mulgarity did. And here's how he did it. After six months in the hole, Garrity was allowed up to work in the kitchen, serving up slop to the inmates and staff alike. Over the next few weeks, he was totally occupied with planning his escape. He managed to fashion a key out of a fork. Yeah. Now, now, that's a bit easy, him working in the kitchen and all. Well, not really. He had to swallow it every night just in case they did a random search of his cell. Ah, oh, Jesus. Every night? <laughs> Over the next year, Garrity kept his head down and managed to make his way to head chef in the kitchen. He gave extra portions of rice pudding to one warden in particular, Frank Darcy, or Frank Death, as they used to call him, because he worked in the morgue. He was a bent screw, as they say, inside, and they both struck a deal. Frank would help Garrity escape in exchange for 20,000 pounds from Garrity's stash. They concocted a most cunning plan. What was it? Well, the key he had fashioned would get him out of his cell, but getting out of the triple-layered, 30-foot, highly guarded prison complex required something ingenious. Tommy Rancid, a, a serial murder, was at death's door with terminal gout of the bowel. The plan was this. When Tommy was dead, Garrity would be given the nod by Warden Frank. He was to slip out of his cell under the cover of darkness, sneak into the morgue, and join Tommy Rancid in his casket. He would escape in the coffin with the corpse, the coffin being punctured with discreet holes. Once you're buried, you'll have five hours of air, plenty of time for me to dig you out. Frank told him. Jesus, that's some plan. Uh, indeed it was. And it worked like a dream. From inside the coffin, Garrity could hear the gates of the prison close behind him. A short journey, and then a few morbid Latin words. And then the scraping of the earth as the coffin was lowered into the six-foot hole. <gasps> Mustn't panic, he thought to himself. Must conserve air. As the soil was piled on, then there was silence. All he could hear was the beating of his own heart. The putrid smell of old Tommy Rancid was starting to make him gag. <sighs> Mustn't panic, he kept repeating. The hours seemed like days. <sighs> What's taken that bastard so long? He muttered to himself, now drenched in sweat, the panic setting in and the air running out. He reached down into his pocket and managed to pull out a lighter. He had to know had he been there 40 minutes or four hours. He struck on the lighter and illuminated the face of his watch. But the watch face wasn't the only face he was confronted by. Yeah, but... but... Tommy Rancid was in there with him. No. Warden Frank. Dead as a doormat. Jesus. Yep. Only minutes after the warden had given him the nod, he had a massive coronary, and poor old Garrity had ended up in the wrong box with the wrong corpse. <laughs> This was one safe that Gus the Mole Garrity would not be breaking out of. So he managed to slip out of one hole, only to end up in another. Eh? Huh? It's easily done, Rog. Easily done. <laughs> Come here. I'll show you my latest trick. Here, lock these for me. Lock me handcuffs. Hey, yo. <laughs> right, now. Set my side of the bed on fire, Podge. I've already doused it with petrol. And yeah. I, the great Rajini, will be free in one minute. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get them tied up. Business is great. Let's see a loop that through. That there. reminds me. 
My 11.30 appointment with Miss Dominina. Oh. Mustn't forget the clamps. Come on, folks. Oh, it's struck. Oh, it's struck. Oh, God, it's getting awful hot. Uh, um, Pat! Eh! Uh, I, I, I'm a bit stuck. Eh, uh, I've changed my mind. Eh, um, I think you better come back and, eh, uh, untie me. Eh, uh, Pat! Pat! Oh, jeez, I'm burning. Oh, 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 oh! Pat! Come back! Eh! Uh, eh! Uh! Oh. Well, if it isn't the scourge of the dance himself, Flat Mickey. Oh. It's Michael Fatley to you. Jesus, your pants look a little large up front. Is there something tickling your tackle? No. If you're a dancer, you've got to wear... Uh... <laughs> Stand out on stage. <laughs> Stand out? You take someone's eye out with that. <laughs> oh, Jesus. What have I told you about putting pets down Jesus. your pants? Uh, it impresses the women. <laughs> oh, Jesus, clothes, box. Mind your clothes. Oh, 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 anyway, hey, oh. hey, you don't want to be entering competitions. It'll only end in disaster. Did I ever tell you about the nuns of... Bumboil Abbey. As you know, nuns are notoriously competitive. I didn't. Especially between uh, the different convents. Oh, there's all kinds of inter-convent rivalry. The, the, the longest uh, vow of silence competition, a speed rosary recitals, toilet abstinence, most pious look of the month. Huh? The list is endless, but the most viciously contested competition of all had to be the oldest nun of the year award. With the ultimate prize being a visit to the winning convent, from his holiness, the Pope himself. <gasps> JP11! Indeed. To meet the Pope is every nun's dream. Let alone have him visit your convent. She would be the envy of every nun in the world. <laughs> As you can imagine, there was some fierce cheating. But nothing would ever match what the nuns of Bumboyle Abbey did. Tell me more. Well... Sister Angina was 152 years old. A dead cert for the oldest Nun of the Year award. The only other threat was uh, Sister Candida, who was six months younger from a convent in Krakatoa, east of Java. Sister Sledge, the head nun at Bunboyle Abbey, was so confident of winning that a whole month before the deadline, she ordered her nuns to set about purging and scalding the whole convent in preparation for his holiness. Come on, sisters. Scrub for Jesus. The excitement was building up. Less than two days to go. Then the unthinkable happened. The yeah, old one died. Yep. Sister Angina, at 152 years and 73 days, had slipped on the over-polished floors and broke her neck. Well, that's that. Yeah, right, well, that's right. No, not quite. Sister Sledge stood over the dead nun, disgusted. Then her whole face lit up as she thought of a drastic plan. She dragged the body into her office and locked the door. She picked up the phone and rang her friend, an ex-missionary priest, Father Finton Fondel. Finton, the convent needs your special assistance, said Sister Sledge. Come now, while it's still dark. There's a bit of work to be done. The next morning in the convent, the nuns could barely contain themselves, for his holiness was only hours away and already in the papal plain. But uh, the old one was dead. She was neither living nor dead. There she sat at her usual spot at the breakfast table. Her eyes glazed over, drool seeping from her mouth. You see, Father Fondel, with his many years as a missionary in deepest Africa, 
and picked up a few voodoo tricks. A zombie nun! Indeed. Uh, Father Fondel had performed some pagan practice and promised that the old nun would sustain a pseudo-life for a few days. Uh, at least long enough for the Pope's visit. And of course, if that's all that Sister Sledge really cared about. At 12 noon, just after the Angelus, the Pope-mobile pulled up. You could cut the excitement with a knife. At last he had arrived. Where is my oldest nun? He said as he was led towards the dribbling wreck. Sister Sledge stood beside the zombie nun. She couldn't believe it. The Pope was really here in her convent. This was the proudest moment of her life. Uh, but as the Pope put out his hand for the oldest nun to kiss, the zombie nun bit his fingers clean off. Jesus! You see, that's what happens when you meddle with the undead. Yep. Poor Sister Sledge had forgotten to take into consideration the flesh-eating bloodlust of the undead. The convent was disgraced and immediately closed down. All the nuns were excommunicated, and rumour has it in the old ruins of the convent, Sister Sledge and a bunch of renegade nuns had sliced up the zombie nun and retrieved Il Papa's holy fingers. And they worshipped them every day as the zombie nuns of Bumboil Abbey. Jesus! Zombie nuns! Huh. Well, that's taken the competitive edge right off me. Uh, I'd better ring Janet, me dance partner, and let her know that I'm finished with this dancing lark. <laughs> Janet, 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 that would be Janet Nee Crotch. Yes. Formerly James O. Crotch. What? <laughs> Don't what? tell me you didn't know. She's a bigger bulge than you. Oh, <laughs> oh Jesus! I was wondering where I was getting the beard rash from. <laughs> more than your buzz. Mrs. Minch hasn't been dead a day, and you're already reefing stuff out of her allotment. But uh, she's got some great oriental herbs in there. You do well to stay clear of that wacky backy. You'll end up on the highway to oblivion, like Brad Fukowski from Methane, Michigan. It was an important day for Brad, one that was going to change his life for the better. <laughs> or at least, that's what he thought. Ah, was he having one of them uh, trans-testicle operations, turning them into the woman he knew he always was? No, he was carrying a suitcase full of cocaine to the biggest deal of his life. The goods were to be exchanged with Michigan's most notorious mobster, Don Keyhole, for a cool half a million dollars. At the rendezvous, the Don sat with three of his cronies with a case full of money in front of him. We gotta check the goods first, said the Don. One of the Don's men took a knife out and cut one of the polythene bags open. As he raised the powder to his mouth, Brad pulled a gun and shot everyone in the room dead. <laughs> Talcum powder wouldn't fetch much on the drugs market. Now that's what I call living on the edge. 
Yeah, right. He had taken a huge risk, but he was so confident that he'd get away with it. He jumped into his car and sped off on a predetermined route. So far, everything was going as planned. Just then, his mobile phone rang. Who could it be? He wasn't expecting a call. It kept on ringing. He picked it up. Hello, Brad. Listen carefully, said the voice. Don't take the next left. The cops are on to you. One of the Don's men was wired. Go straight to the hideout, and I'll call you back. Brad was confused. Who the hell was that? Was it a setup? He could hear sirens. So he took a right turn and headed for the hideout. Who was it on the phone? Well, the voice sounded familiar, but he couldn't quite place who it was. But his instinct was to trust the mysterious caller. Back at the hideout, he got his second call. Hey, who the f*** are you? And what the f*** do you want for f***'s sake, man? Shouted Brad. I'm you, Brad, said the caller. I'm ringing you from the future. Brad was stunned. Listen, Joker. I don't f***ing particularly appreciate you f***ing with my mind at this particular point in my f***ing career. So why don't you tell me who the f*** you are and how the f*** you got my number? Shut up, Brad, and listen carefully. I'm ringing you from the year 2040. I've just cut the prison warden's neck, and I'm calling you in the future phone to try and change my past and our future and avoid 60 years in prison. So, uh... It was himself ringing himself from the near future. <coughs> it's hard to believe. Indeed. Uh, but as Brad listened to the caller and to all the details that no one could possibly know other than himself, he began to be convinced. There's not much time. Go to the airport as planned. But don't go to the Air Mexico check-in desk, because that's where we got caught last time. I've organized a new identity for you when you get to the airport. As he entered the airport, Brad received his third phone call. Your false passport is in locker 325. Your new name is Norman Horn, said the caller. And Brad laughed. <laughs> f it, man. That's the name I would have chosen. <laughs> you did, said the caller. Now the tickets I booked for you will get you to Mexico via Phoenix. The cops won't have thought of that route. You're on your own now. This is where our past and future merge. Whatever happens from now on is unknown, but I'm sure looking forward to our new life in Mexico. Brad said bye-bye to himself and boarded the plane for his new destiny. So, did he get to Mexico? Oh yeah, it all went smoothly. In fact, two months had passed and Brad was enjoying his new life. He constantly thought about the phone calls and <laughs> how he could have ended up in prison for 60 years. He was lucky, all right. <laughs> Spending all his ill-gotten gains and high living and bizarre sexual antics. No, he was a bit more cautious than that. He had a bit of cop on. In fact, one day he brought his suitcase full of money down to the bank. He was going to put it in there for safekeeping. As Brad was crossing the road, his mobile phone rang. <laughs> As he was reaching into his pocket to answer it, some crazed, drugged-up gun robber burst out of the bank. With only Brad standing between him and his getaway car, it only took a split second before Brad had a bullet between the eyes. As he hit the ground, his heart stopped beating, and his mobile phone stopped ringing. <laughs> Jesus, that's shocking. Yeah. Of course, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Indeed, indeed, indeed. <sighs> so, um... Huh. What's that wacky-backy stuff like, uh... Good's great. Right. <laughs> You should have a go. Ah, uh, you should, no, 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 no. Ah, uh, no, no, it go wouldn't, on, go it on, wouldn't go. affect me. I, I have a strong constitution. Go on, have a go. That would maybe... Will you this? Quincy won't...
Hey man, this is some righteous weed, excellent. <laughs> Hit me with some sensational sound. Right, right. <laughs> Hey man, it's really good, man. Shocking night. I'll tell you where I was. I was over at Gypsy Rose Provenance. Yeah. She had to look at me balls for me. She, she what? Yeah, she's got one for the future. Oh. And one for the past. Oh, right, right, yeah. yeah. She says in the near future, she could see me having a windfall. Hey. <laughs> windfall? Yep. Yeah. When will you ever learn to stop flittle flattling around with the supernatural? You'll end up like Katrina Eczema. From Rash Ring. So she had her future told, huh? Oh, yeah. By the famous Madame Vargina. She, of course, claims to be the world's greatest psychic, with readings 100% accurate. She told Katrina that she was going to meet a man, marry him, and become a millionaire. Beckett, I should have gone to her. After the fortune-telling, Katrina was delighted because that was all she ever wanted, to be rich and live the life she thought she deserved. She wanted it all, and she wanted it fast. And uh, when she found her fortune, she was going to share it with nobody. Over the next few days, Katrina had her eye on every fella that crossed her path, wondering if he was the man with the money. But it wasn't until she was having drinks after work that she overheard a man at the bar. I'm Ireland's number one cigar importer. He boasted. This must be him. <laughs> With her luck, he was probably a good-looking stud boy. Uh, no, unfortunately, he was a pig-ugly bastard with breath like a rhino's colon. But that didn't matter to Katrina. All she could see were pound signs in his eyes. So after a bit of courting, Benji Swillshank of Swillshank Cigars and Katrina Eczema from Rash Ring became husband and wife. As he leaned over to kiss the bride, his rancid breath made her gag. But the thought of the money settled her stomach. That evening, Katrina couldn't believe her eyes as Benji carried her over the threshold of a very modest dwelling. Oh, yeah. A shithole! Yep. Oh, let's get down to some good loving, baby. <sighs> it, he said. <laughs> Before we do, can you explain to me why I'm not living in a swimming pool mansion? I thought you were a millionaire. She growled. He explained that his terminally ill father had all the money, but he was about to pop off at any minute. Then they would be in the clover with more money than cents. <laughs> so she laid back and thought of flash cars, fur coats, fancy holidays, and a few toy boys on the side. Whilst the putrid walrus sweated out of his tobacco drenched pores as he had his wicked way with her. <laughs> Suppose for a million quid, I'd puff in his cigar. Next day, she got the news. Daddy Swillshank was dead and left all his money to... Benji! No, the revenue commissioners. Old man Swillshank was a very poor bookkeeper and the tax men swooped in his carcass like vultures. Jesus. Madame Virginia was wrong for the very first time in her life. That's what Katrina thought and she couldn't spend one more minute in the presence of her revolting husband. She left the house she hated with murder on her mind. She was going to kill that pig of a husband for leading her on. She walked into the DIY store to pick up some rat poison. As she got to the till, an alarm bell rang. She was the millionth customer! 
and Katrina had won a million pounds! Aha! The fortune teller was right, so she did become a millionaire. She got back to the apartment and started to pack her things. Poor Benji got back from the funeral. He was very upset. What are you doing, Katrina? He asked. Getting out of here, you fat pig! She snapped. But what about our marriage, Katrina? He asked. I only married you for your money. But now that I've got my own, I don't want to smell your vile body stench ever again. She said as she headed for the door, Benji's jealous streak burst forth. Well, if I can't have you, no one can. He yelled as he lunged at her, pushing her down the long flight of stairs. She lay in a heap with a broken neck, covered in her precious money. Jesus, that's shocking. So, uh, <laughs> Madame Virginia's fortune telling was 100% correct, but poor El Katrina was only a millionaire for five minutes. <laughs> she didn't even get to spend a penny. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> I'm looking forward to all my money. <laughs> Why, what exactly did your fortune teller tell you? That I'd have a windfall this evening. <laughs> Wind? <laughs> you, you big gob <laughs> Oh, shite. Ebola virus, is it? Huh? Huh? What is it? Ah, <laughs> uh, how are you? Where were you? <laughs> I was uh, down in the village doing the laundry. <laughs> now, how'd you get on? I got five pairs of panties, oh. two bras, and a lovely pair of nylons. Oh. <laughs> Dirty <laughs> devil, yeah. <laughs> Will they, um, fit? Uh, take a look. <gasps> oh, lace. <laughs> <laughs> Come here. Oh, I see you. Uh, Feel him up Finbar is back from his holidays. Uh. <laughs> Had a miserable time by all accounts. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it was as bad as this couple's trip abroad. Turlock and Hannah Royds from Rectal's Pass were heading away on their first holiday in years. Turlock had opened a new business and for five years couldn't afford to take the time off. Meanwhile, Hannah stayed at home to look after her invalid mother, who'd had a stroke and couldn't get around by herself. She was a nice old one, and although Hannah never complained, she and her husband needed a holiday. The fella in Sputum's travel recommended Mexico. <laughs> the sun, sea, sand, and other stuff. He said... Oh, it's a great place to <laughs> unwind. Uh, so they packed their bags and were all set to go. Hannah had made arrangements with Mrs. Splatter, who lived at the end of the road, to look after her mother while they were away. Ah, so they had it all organised, so? Yep, they were all ready to go, but Mrs. Splatter was an hour late. <laughs> Where is she? We'll miss our bloody plane! Turlock was getting impatient. Hey, calm down. I just rang her. She lost track of time. She said she'd be up in two minutes. Hannah reassured him. Well, let's go. She's got keys. She can let herself in. So they kissed their mother goodbye and left her watching neighbours on the telly. As they were packing their car, an idiot came down the road and nearly ploughed into them. Joyriding, drop scene, waster. You thinking, Egypt? Well, that's a great start to our holiday, Turlock shouted. The sooner we get in that plane, the better. <laughs> Had you a bit of a stressed head on him? <laughs> I sure tell you what, the holiday will do him the world of good. Oh, you think so, do you?
Firstly, the plane was delayed by ten hours. When they arrived in Mexico, they had a five-hour trip in the back of a truck oh. to their hotel, which turned out to be not much more than a corrugated shed. The dream holiday had gotten off to a bad start, and it wasn't going to get much better. Their room was small and windowless. The bathwater was brown, and they shared a bed with numerous cockroaches. The beach described in the brochure as... <laughs> Within walking distance is a white silvery strand of <laughs> heavenly paradise. Was in fact 40 miles away and acted as a sewage dump for the town of Chitoga. Then there was the cataclysmic bout of diarrhea that Hannah suffered and the four days in bed with a swollen lad that Turlock had got from a jellyfish sting. Jesus. And after the first week, their room was ransacked and all their stuff was nicked, including passports. It took them five days to get a temporary visa home from their so-called embassy. Uh, come here. Did they uh, get to go on any of them... Uh... Nudie bitches. Back up, uh. gob, Sheen. When they eventually got off the plane, Turlock kissed the tarmac. Thank God we're home, he said. They got in their car and sped home, dreaming of baths, decent food, and getting back into old routines. i never take another holiday as long as I live. I swear to you, Hannah, if another thing had gone wrong, I'd have lost my mind. <laughs> so he was glad to be home then? <laughs> ah, he was, yeah. He turned the key in the door. Only to be greeted by... The old mother-in-law. No. The putrid stench of rotten flesh. Huh? The mother was sat in front of the flickering telly, just as they had left her two weeks ago. Rotting in her own juices, with stage six rigor mortis set in. Jesus. Did the neighbour not come in and look after her? Well, she would have, if she wasn't mowed down and killed by the same joyriding bastard as she walked the short distance to Hannah Royd's house only moments after they had left. <laughs> the mother lasted five days sitting in her chair unable to move. No one came to look after her as no one knew. With her carer on a cold marble slab in the morgue. <laughs> Jesus, that's shocking, huh? Know, yeah. <laughs> Do you think, uh, do you think if we went on a holiday for two weeks, would, uh, Granny end up, uh, dead on a cold slab in the morgue? Ah, Jesus, we've tried everything, so you know she's in league with the, uh, Dark Lord. The queer fella! Jesus, don't say it too loud, she'll hear you! Oh! 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 Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, it started. Oh, no. Oh, I'm nervous. Ah. Oh, what a great night out. Granny loves the boxing. She's got a mean left hook. Floored Mrs. Leakey. Sent her old teeth flying into the front row. Blood everywhere. <laughs> the crowd went bad. Shh. Anyway, hey, yeah. you were in bed this morning, you lazy gobsheen. Yeah. Did you not get up yet? Well, <laughs> I've been uh, up all day. Uh, this is the problem. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Have you been at that Viagra again? I told you, that special agricultural stuff for bulls only. Oh, is there, um, nothing you could rub into that, take it down a foot or two? Um, no, uh, I've tried rubbing. It only makes it worse. Well, you, you missed great crack at the boxing. Well, I was too, uh, embarrassed to go. Ah, uh, listen, oh. there's a lot more embarrassing things than a... Permanent pocket rocket. Oh, like what? Well, like what happened to Shane Sist from Squitter's Bridge. A girl pulled into Sist's service station 
in a seriously expensive sports car. She was only gorgeous. Oh, come here. Did she look anything like uh, you know who? Yep. She was the oh. spit of Mary Black. Oh. oh, stop, will you? This thing will never go down. <laughs> oh. Oh. Melandra Potter Pube was her name, and she was way out of Shane's league. But as he was filling her tank, she gave him the glad eye. They got to talking, and within the month, they were dating. <laughs> Come here, was he her bit of rough, was he? <laughs> no, they actually did like each other. And even though she was an uptown, up-tempo woman, and he was a downtown, downbeat guy, love overcame the barriers of class. <laughs> Everything was going grand until one day she arrived at the garage and invited Shane to a big family get-together that weekend. I want Mama and Papa's approval for our forthcoming engagement. <laughs> she announced. He couldn't believe his ears. She had just proposed to him. Something he would have been too afraid to ever ask someone of her class. So where uh, did he go to the do? Oh yeah, a limo picked him up at his house and drove him to Pube Manor. He was a bag of nerves as he entered the mansion. It was a fierce, swanky affair. Oh yeah, did they have those crackers with the little balls of shite on top of them? Oh yeah. Ugh. And Melandra introduced Shane to all her society friends. After a couple of glasses of champers, he began to ease up a bit. But there was still the big announcement. The stomach was in knots as they sat down to dinner. After the main course, Melandra stood up and winked at Shane. Uh, Mama and Papa, family and friends, I have an announcement to make. <laughs> Shane and I would so dearly love your approval, so we may get married. <laughs> Oh, there were lots of oohs and ahs, <laughs> and all eyes were fixed on Papa Potter Pube. He stood up. Well, Melandra, although we've only met him for the first time this evening, Shane seems like a decent enough gentleman. But I feel six months is a, such a short time. Why don't we all get to know each other a little bit better before I give my consent. In the meantime, here's to Melandra and Shane. <laughs> At that instant, Shane felt relief and an overwhelming urge to go to the bathroom. Ah, yeah. It was all the nerves. He was in a right sweat by the time he got to the toilet. He locked the door behind him and had a horrendous <laughs> evacuation. <laughs> Goods. Yeah. yeah, he tidied himself up and flushed the toilet. The handle spun weakly, and the toilet remained fully loaded. After a couple more attempted flushes, he started to panic. Oh, no. He got the loo brush at it, <laughs> but to no avail. Feck it, he thought to himself. I'm the only one who's left the table. If I leave it, they'll know it was me. Jesus, what did he do? Ah, he had to get rid of it. He did the only thing he could. He flung the pagan pile out of the window. He washed his hands, straightened his tie, and made his way back to the dining room for coffee. But instead of the usual after-dinner chit-chat, he was met with a deathly silence and cold stare. He turned to Melandra and shrugged, as if to ask, what's wrong? Melandra turned her eyes away and pointed up. Shane's eyes followed her finger up to the glass conservatory ceiling, where he was reunited with the sight of his own bowel movement, streaking down the glass roof. Like, like, a, like a brown Haley's Comet. Eh, 
He's back working the pumps now. Melandra married some Dublin pumps. His chance of marrying money has gone out the window. Window. <laughs> out the window. <laughs> Come here, he should put the whole thing behind him. <laughs> he needs to wipe it from his mind. Only I. How careful now with that. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen. Oh, Pox, get away from that. Oh, oh. So, did you give me a present or what? No. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Because I didn't get you anything either. Hmm. Got myself something, though. What is it? It's a surprise. It... But you bought it yourself. Yeah, but I don't want to ruin the surprise. How can it be a surprise if you bought it yourself? Shut up, you! Oh. Oh, don't open it now. <laughs> I wonder what it is. Well, what could it be? Huh? What could it... Gobshy. Ah, oh, shite. A pair of socks. Same feckin' present every year. <sighs> You're some feckless gob, Sheen. Anyway, I bought something myself as well. What is it? <laughs> it's Fester and Aylin's new album of Alpine music. Fester and Aylin's Raging Horns. Do you want to hear the Christmas single? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas, I oh, love a day. <laughs> Christmas bells are ringing, reeds hanging on the door, the fairies on the tree, presents on the floor. Santa Claus is coming, all the children's waiting's done, but I wouldn't hold your breath, kids, cause Aylin's got his gun. It was a quiet Christmas Eve, we were snuggled up in bed, we heard hooves upon the roof. That's when Aiden raised his head. He ran down to the front room, brandishing his gun. Aided up the chimney, shot the intruder up the bum. There's a dead man up the chimney, some call him old Saint Nick. We shot him up the arse, we poked him with a stick. Oh, Christmas is cancelled, old white beard is dead. We tried to pull him down, we'll have to burn him out instead. There'll be no more presents, there'll be no more joy. With the reindeer put down and the elves all unemployed. Don't bother with the tree, no more excitement going to bed. Cause Aylin shot out Santa Claus and pumped him full of lead. There's a dead man up the chimney, some call him old Saint Nick. We shot him up the arse and we poked him with a stick. Oh, Christmas is cancelled, old white beard is dead. We tried to pull him down, we'll have to burn him out instead. So did you slay Santa Aylin, what? Huh? Did you shoot him in the sack? <laughs> Rudolph has a red nose now, with blood. Come on, kids! Oh, there's a dead man up the chimney, some call him old Saint Nick. We shot him up the arse and we poked him with a stick. Oh, Christmas is cancelled, oh, white beard is dead. We tried to pull him down, we have to burn him out instead. <laughs> <laughs> then you what, that's a smashing tune. Yeah. It's got me right in the mood. <laughs> yeah, here, did you, did you sort out uh, Christmas dinner? I have. Ah, good man. I love Christmas dinner. Big old turkey and stuffing, huh? Mmm. Yummy yum. <laughs> well, eh, uh, I've got the stuffing done. But? Well, technically it's not a turkey. Technically not a turkey? Well, what the feck is it then? Huh? I mean... used to pox so stuffing. Oh. <laughs> There's a dead man up the chimney, some call him old Saint Nick. 
We shot him up the arse We poked him with a stick Oh, Christmas is cancelled Our white beard is dead We tried to pull him down We'll have to burn him out instead Oh, there's a dead man up the chimney Some call him Mosaic Nick We shot him up the arse And we poked him with a stick Oh, Christmas is cancelled Our white beard is dead We tried to pull him down we we'll have to burn him out instead was cancelled. Right. But what's that you got? Oh, wait. Uh, nothing. Nothing there at all. What's a video? What is it? Ah, uh, you wouldn't be interested at all at all. It's sort of a follow-up to the Titanic, yeah. All right, and what's it called, then? Uh, going down. Mm, and who's in it? Um, Leonardo the Cockring, oh. and uh, Kate whips it. You dirty devil. What have I told you about renting smut? You'll only get yourself into trouble. There's nothing wrong with my eyesight. Ah, you'll end up like Dave Knuckleshuffle from Hee Haw County Boyle. Eh? He was a quiet lad. Worked in the bank. Unassuming fella, not much luck with the ladies. Spent many lonely nights at home with love on his mind. Oh, very hard for a young man to uh, suppress those natural urges. Oh. Yes, it was, but... Uh, he managed to find a release. Oh, <laughs> did he have a date with uh, Pam and her five sisters, huh? <laughs> but you see, he'd go down to midnight movies and rent romantic comedies. Eh? Did they? Sleepless in Seattle would hardly give you the horn. Yeah, you're right. So one night, oh, he plucked up the courage yeah. to venture into the... Uh, Adult entertainment section. <laughs> he grabbed the first video from the top shelf and ran to the till. <laughs> oh, Debbie does draw her, this, sir. Oh, on her own tonight, are we, sir? Ask the man behind the counter. Oh, it's for a friend. Dave stuttered. Oh, right. It's nothing to be ashamed of, sir. We're all looking for that ideal companion. Oh, is said the clerk. Oh, but I think I've something more suitable for your needs, sir. Round the back. Dave stepped into the storeroom. There were shelves of videos with names on them. He took one off with Dave written on it. Oh, why don't you take her home, Dave? You won't be disappointed, sir. Oh, no. Oh. Dave handed the clerk a fiver and left with his video date. Oh, I bet he couldn't wait to play it. <laughs> he got home, took the phone off the hook, grabbed a beer from the fridge and pressed play with his free hand. The video began with a beautiful woman opening a door. Oh, hello, Dave. I've been expecting you. I'm all yours this evening. Oh. oh. Dave was glued to the screen. Yeah. Oh. Why don't you come on in, big boy? I've prepared a romantic meal for two. Oh. She purred, and Dave's eyes followed her wiggling hips into the candlelit table. His eyes craved her heaving bust line as she ate suggestively over three courses. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Dave, that was great. But I'm used to having more than three courses inside me. Jesus! Was he on a raging horn, huh? Then she began to unclasp her scant clothing. Oh, oh, oh. oh, it's so hot in here. She oh. said. Dave, why don't we take something off and get more 
comfortable. She started to strip off. Oh! Come join me in bed. You're turning me on, big boy. This was the greatest video he had ever seen. It was just like being there. Oh, oh, Dave, give it to me now. Oh, oh. She started moaning with pleasure. Just then, the door opened. Was it one of her girlfriends, was it? No, it was her husband, John. Ugh, wouldn't be into that. The husband wasn't too happy. What the hell are you doing with my wife, Dave? Oh, I can't believe you, of all people, would do this. I trusted you, man. Dave watched the screen in horror as the husband pulled a gun and shot the wife right between the eyes. Jesus. Then the husband turned the gun on himself. I can't live with myself knowing you betrayed me like this. I hope you're happy. I'll see you in hell, Dave. Then he pulled the trigger and blew his brains out. Dave reeled back in shock. The doorbell rang. Dave staggered over to the door, dazed and confused. As he reached for the handle, two policemen burst in. Dave Knuckle Shuffle, we want to talk to you about a video we found at a crime scene this evening. We believe you may be involved in a double murder, said the officer. Dave told them he'd been home all evening, but of course there were no witnesses. Cuff him, Brian. Look what he's watching on his video. It's all the evidence we need, you sick bastard, Dave. It said the officer as they dragged him away. <laughs> Jesus. Um, that's shocking. Yeah. Uh, Beckett, I I'll drop this video back. I wouldn't be able to sleep with it in the house. Uh, it's for the best, yeah. Now, my beauties. Oh, tonight's feature presentation, starring Sigourney Weaver and Gwyneth Porno, <laughs> Diving Muff Daisy. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> do I know you? Huh? Ah, sure, uh, sure. It's only your uh, better looking brother with his uh, new hair. <laughs> Jesus, what have you gone and done with your head, you feckless rogue? Well, well uh, Sadie from the abattoir did it for me. Oh, it's the uh, black from the black pudding, oh, don't you know? <laughs> it's a modern style. Sadie says it takes uh, years off yep. me. Big lump of idiot! Hmm? You're a vain gobsheen! You should just be happy the way you are and not be so concerned about uh, keeping up appearances. I suppose you have not heard the story of Ozzy Dorgan uh, from Slurry. Yeah, I remember your man, yeah. Yeah, Ozzy Dorgan, uh, from the parochial hall lap dancing. <laughs> sure, he was always puffed up with the latest cardigans and smelling of odd spice. Ah, oh, yeah, he was forever preening himself, wasn't he? <laughs> and spending money on his looks. He had a nice girlfriend. Bachelor pad, in fact, he, everything he ever wanted. Yeah. Did he have the uh, Mary Black singles collection? Undoubtedly. Oh. Then there was a, a change in his life. Uh, oh. uh, something that happens to a lot of men approaching middle age. Oh, yeah, it was uh, was his little fireman not making it to the uh, top of the ladder? <laughs> no, 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 no. He first noticed it in the shower. There was a lot more hair in the plug hole than normal. Huh? Over the next couple of weeks, it started to really bug him. He went to the doctor to see if there was any solution to it. Hmm, was your father bald? The doctor asked. Ozzy remembered his father's nickname, the cue ball. Well, it's hereditary. There's no medical cure for it. Best thing to do is to go home and not worry about it. Sure, that'd only make it worse. Ozzy went home and did nothing but worry. And over the next couple of months, he bought every hair care product, potion and pill, but to no avail. 
His hair was slowly receding. Yeah, but you're, it's only a bit of hair. Oh, no, you could never say that to Ozzy. His looks were his life. The paranoia was setting in. He couldn't go out without a big old stupid hat in his head. And even then he thought people were talking about his baldness. His girlfriend was driven demented by his frenzy of follicle fanaticism. She told him that his obsession would drive them apart and he was not to call her until he copped on and sorted himself out. That very night he was looking at the telly when this fella came on eulogising about a revolutionary new hair restorer on the market. As he phoned the number that was flashing on the screen and made an appointment with the hair expert. So how did he get on? Well, the hair fella told Ozzy the product would indeed restore his hair, but it was imperative that Ozzy only applied the correct dosage of lotion over a six-month period. He went home with the miracle cure, but he had gotten weary of following instructions as directed on pack. He would be damned if he was going to wait six months for a result, and he poured the whole bottle of stuff over his head. He woke up the next morning and walked into the bathroom, only to be confronted by the new look Aussie with a full head of hair. Jesus, that stuff's powerful. Oh, it was, because by lunchtime, it was down to his shoulders. He was walking round with his head held high. Then he bumped into his girlfriend. <laughs> oh, wow, Ozzy, you look great. Oh, why don't I come over tonight and run my fingers through your hair. She purred. Ozzy was on top of the world. <laughs> Welcome to your new life, Ozzy Dorgan, he said to himself. That night the girlfriend arrived over. Ozzy's hair had grown over six inches since lunchtime and he was coughing. <coughs> I have a bit of a sore throat, he told her. Uh, would you have a look at it for me, love? Uh, she had a look, and indeed, there seemed to be something caught in his throat. What was it? A hair. A hair? Is this uh, story going anywhere, or should I just stick my old head down the... Well, the unusual thing was the hair was two foot long <gasps> and rooted in Ozzy's larynx. Jesus. She tugged at it as he screamed in pain. Then she noticed the tufts of hair sprouting from his ears. What? And then out his nose. In fact, hair started popping up out of every pore in his body. Jesus! He must have looked like a feckin' werewolf! He did! And within two hours, he was dying an agonizing death. Sure, how could you breathe with hair growing inside your lungs? How could you think with hair growing inside your brain? And how could you survive with hair clogging up your heart? If only he had followed the instruction. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> I suppose it was a case of hair today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> Shut up, you jumped up punts! Now turn off the lights. I'm tired of your going on, you right. stupid <laughs> Oh, Mary Black. Oh, thank you. Oh, Mary Black. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, Is that your hand? Huh? Oh, eh, sorry. Football. <clears throat> Football. Oh, Football. Hurling. Oh, <gasps> Wink. 